Today I'm going to talk about IPL and laser light energy and just how far they penetrate into the skin. Plus I'm going to do some calculations to show how many photons we use when we uh, do these treatments. So if we look at the uh, emission spectrum from a, um, an IPL system, um, this is the uh, output from a, a Xenon lamp, which is typically used in modern day IPL systems. Um, so we can see that there's a lot of energy here in the visible part of the spectrum from about 350 to about 750 nanometers. And then there's a, a big chunk of energy in the infrared part of the spectrum, which is invisible to us. Um, and we tend to feel the infrared as heat energy. Uh, we don't tend to see it as, as light. So you can see that there's a quite a, uh, a broad uh, range of wavelengths here for a typical IPL device. So where does all this light go when it penetrates into the skin? Well, if we break it down into the various uh, wavelength ranges, we can see that uh, blue light here doesn't penetrate too deeply into the skin. It only goes to around about um, 0.6 millimeters depth. Now, this is a depth where the uh, incident fluence at the skin surface has dropped to a level of 37%, which is, uh, we call that the 1 over E depth. Um, this is just a, a mathematical definition. Now, the reason that um, the beam, the, the blue light spreads out so far is due to the anisotropy. The anisotropy is a measure of the, um, the scattering of the, the individual photons. So blue light, blue light scatters quite widely. So we can see it, it does spread out um, quite far from the original um, spot size. The amount of energy in this uh, pulse of light, which is attributable to the blue light, is only about 14% of, of the total energy. Then we have the green light, which is about almost the same as the blue, it's about 13% of the total energy but it penetrates a little bit deeper, about 1.1 millimeters, because it's um, anisotropy is not as wide as with blue light. Then we have the yellow light. Now there's only about 4% of the energy in, uh, in the yellow part of the spectrum, so it's a relatively small um, region of the overall output. But it does penetrate a little bit deeper, about 1.6 uh, millimeters in depth. And then red light, uh, which consists of about 17% of the total energy, it goes a little bit deeper again, about 2.6 millimeters. And then finally, we have the infrared light, which in actual fact, infrared um, comprises just slightly more than half of all the energy from a, a Xenon flash lamp. And as you can see here, a lot of it penetrates to um, some considerable depth, 10.5 millimeters. Now, just keep in mind that these depths are defined as the one over E, or 37% of the original um, fluence at the surface depths. Um, it's purely a mathematical um, a concept so that uh, we, we can do side-by-side -side comparisons like this. And then if, if we look at laser light, of course, laser only has uh, one wavelength, it's monochromatic. Um, so the full 100% energy is all in that, uh, that small wave band, uh, wavelength range. But the penetration depths are quite different for the different wavelengths. So the Alexandrite laser, which is a 755 nanometer um, wavelength, penetrates about 3.1 millimeters. The diode laser that we use typically for hair removal, um, usually it's um, 808 or 810 nanometers, and it can penetrate a little bit further to about 3.8 millimeters. But the ND YAG laser with the 1064 uh, nanometer wavelength, it penetrates the furthest, 9.7, and that's mostly because its, um, its absorption is so low um, in the constituents in the skin and its scattering is um, very much forward. In other words, the anisotropy um, basically um, helps to um, forward the, the beam rather than spread it out. So you can see that um, uh, in this case, you've got the YAG at 9.7. Some of the IPL went down to it was about 10.5 or something like that. So um, the, the infrared portions of um, both the IPL and the NDI uh, laser reach about the same penetration depth, which is not surprising. This is exactly what we should expect. So how many photons are there in each pulse of light? And this will become um, clearer um, after I do these calculations, um, why, why we want to know this. So how do we calculate 
the number of photons in, in a pulse of energy? Well, we can use something known as the, the Planck equation, which is uh, the, the energy of each individual photon equals h, which is Planck's constant, times the frequency of that light. And the frequency is just the um, speed of light divided by the wavelength. So it's a very straightforward equation, but this tells us how much energy each individual photon has, and that depends on its wavelength or frequency. So for example, um, the frequency of a 1064 nanometer beam from um, an NDI laser is going to be three point, uh, sorry, three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second, that's speed of light, divided by the wavelength, which is 1064 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, which gives us a frequency of 2.8 times 10 to the power 14 hertz, which is 280 trillion hertz. So it's an extremely high frequency. Okay, so now we know the frequency, we can use the Planck equation to calculate the energy of each individual photon. So we plug in the 2.8 times 10 to the 14 hertz, multiply it by the Planck constant, which is at 6.626 uh, times 10 to the minus 34, and the energy of each individual photon then, for, for this particular wavelength, works out at um, 1.868 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So each individual photon has a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of energy, not, not very much at all. So if we know that the energy of one photon of 1064 nanometer light is uh, 1.868 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, then one joule of energy of this uh, wavelength must contain uh, this number of photons. And that number is equal to one divided by the energy of one photon, uh, because here we're looking at one joule of energy. And this is equal to 5.35 times 10 to the 18 photons of 1064 nanometer in one joule of energy. That's equal to 5.35 million, million, million photons. That's a lot of photons, but we can't see them because they're all tiny. Okay, so now we know that number for 1064. What, what's the, the number of photons of the 532 beam? 532 is exactly half of 1064, and this is the beam that we can generate um, using Q-switched or picosecond lasers, um, using um, frequency doubling uh, um, devices. Um, so using the Planck equation again, we find that the energy of one photon at 532 is, uh, is only 3.736 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So therefore the number of photons is 1 over that number, which is equal to 2.67 times 10 to the 18 photons in 1 joule of 532 nanometer light. And that is exactly half the number of the photons found in one joule of 1064 nanometer light. Because 532 is precisely half of 1064, which means the frequency of the 532 is twice the frequency of the 1064, because wavelength and, and uh, frequency go hand in hand. So if the frequency of the 532 photon is double the frequency of the 1064, then it means that the energy of that individual photon of 532 must be twice the energy of a single photon of 1064. So there you go, that's that's how we, we do these uh, calculations. And you might wonder, well, quite why we're doing this? Well, I'll show you why. In case you want to, to um, do this yourself, um, <laughs> you never know, the number of photons is equal to the wavelength, and I put the numbers in, in uh, nanometers, and then just divide that by 1.982 times 10 to the minus 16. And as long as you put um, the wavelength in nanometers, so you could say 1064, 532, or you could use 694 for the Ruby, or 755 for the Alexandria, or whatever, um, then that will give you the number of photons in one joule of that uh, light energy. And obviously, if you want to know what it is in two joules, you just double it. If you want to know what it is in half a joule, you just half it. So there you are. you can do some of these weak calculations at home and uh, 
when uh, if, if you're so inclined. So why, why would we want to know about the number of photons in a, in a pulse of energy? Well, it, it can be useful for things like this next um, discussion. Why does the spot size affect the penetration depth? It's, it's not immediately obvious, but um, it's well known in, in uh, both um, theory and in um, uh, laboratory testing. So if we fired a laser pulse, and it doesn't matter if it's laser or IPL, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we fire a laser pulse at the skin surface and that pulse um, hits the skin surface with a radius, we'll just assume it's circular, it's got a radius of R. And then we fire another pulse just next to it, only this uh, radius is now twice the radius of the, the first pulse, but it's the same fluids. Right, so if let's say it was I don't know ten joules per square centimeter each of these pulses, one's got radius r, the other one's got radius of two times r. So to maintain that fluence in the bigger spots, we need to increase the energy from the laser by a factor of four, because the bigger spot size is twice the radius. The area is the square of the radius, so the big spot size radius is going to be. 4 r squared pi compared to um, r squared pi, which is the smaller spot. So the bigger spot has four times the area just because it's twice the, the radius or, or diameter. Therefore, the bigger spot, or the, or the, 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 yeah, the bigger spot um, on the right hand side here, must have four times the number of photons entering the skin. If you've increased the energy from the laser by a factor of four, then that means there are four times the number of, uh, of photons too. And what that does is, because we've got all those extra photons, um, a lot of them can penetrate deeper into the skin. Uh, just even though it's a, the, the same wavelength and you could have the same pulse with them and what have you, um, just by virtue of the fact that we've got a bigger spot, means we have more photons and therefore more of them can penetrate uh, deeper into the skin. So how do we increase the fluence in a laser or an IPL? Well, let's go back to the definition of fluence. Fluence measured in joules per square centimeter is simply the energy from the laser uh, applied to the skin surface divided by the spot size area that you're firing um, at the skin surface. So th 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 this means there are two ways to increase the fluence. Either we can increase the energy output from the laser or the IPL, you just turn up the, uh, the power uh, or energy from the machine, or you can decrease the spot size on the skin surface. Um, and if you do both of these, then you can create quite a wide range of fluences that uh, you might, uh, might want to use. So it's quite straightforward, either increase energy or change either decrease or increase the spot size, depending on whether you want to increase or decrease the fluence. So let's compare a couple of these things. Let's fire in our box standard laser and we'll fire in this one here. The one on the right, even though it's uh, the same spot size, uh, exactly the same uh, wavelength spot size, etc., but it's a higher fluence um, and it's a higher fluence in this case because we have increased the energy from the laser. Uh, the spot size is exactly the same in both of these cases, so therefore it must be due to um, higher energy coming from the laser. That's why we have more uh, higher, higher energy, higher fluence here. And this means then that again uh, we have more photons entering the skin. So we can see that uh, the fluence controls everything here. The, 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 the more fluence you fire into the skin, the deeper the photons can reach. And this is really quite um, critically important when we're treating things like um, hair and uh, blood vessels and tattoos and such. Uh, because if you're trying to target deep uh, targets, quite deep in the dermis, then um, inevitably you will have to will have to um, increase your fluence to get sufficient energy down there. And sometimes we're better off not using a smaller spot size, we're better off using higher energies uh, from the laser or IPL. 
And then just to finish off this wee section, um, if we just look purely at how light penetrates the skin just based solely on the wavelengths, then we can see that uh, blue light and yellow light don't really penetrate too far into the skin. Uh, yellow, sorry, blue and green that was, and then yellow light penetrates a little bit further, but red and infrared penetrate um, the furthest. And we, I put in here some uh, potential targets, um, some blood vessels and um, uh, pigmentation and, and a hair follicle. So you can see here that uh, if, if, you, if you try to, for example, if you were trying to treat the hair follicle using blue light, um, you might think that's a good idea because blue light is very, very strongly absorbed in melanin, but it's pointless because the blue light cannot penetrate anywhere near to the depth of the, um, the bulb of the hair, it's way too deep. The only way you could get blue light down there, down there is by having a huge fluence, which would probably cause all sorts of problems in the uh, upper dermis and certainly in the epidermis and the basal layer. So we have to choose the wavelength to uh, be sure we're getting enough energy deep enough into the, the dermis or, or the epidermis if it's superficial so that um, we can get enough energy there to do the, the job that we're trying to, um, to complete. Thanks for listening. Um, I have to say that uh, the way light interacts with the skin is quite tricky, as you've seen here. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors to think about, um, particularly the um, absorption and scattering, um, which changes from across the wavelengths. So having a, a bit of understanding of this should hopefully help you to improve your, your treatment outcomes. Um, and um, hopefully make them more efficient and safer too. You can find more of this kind of stuff on my blog, mikemurphyblog.com, or on uh, our YouTube channel where you're probably watching this at the moment. Thanks, Ed. Bye.